Good afternoon and welcome to our Oak Bend Medical Center Happy Hour podcast. My name is Donna and I am your host. I am very excited to introduce our guest today as we speak about respiratory health. Christy Berger is a cardiopulmonary manager at Oak Bend Medical Center. She has been employed with Oak Bend Medical Center since 2004. She has been active in the community outreach program and presently serves as a development board member. Christy also participates with the College of American Pathology as a lab inspector for area hospitals and a member of the American Association of Respiratory Care and Texas Society of Respiratory Care. For those that don't know what a cardiopulmonary specialist is, I just want to kind of put my two cents worth in. These guys in this team is an amazing team. They handle all things cardio, respiratory. They do ventilators. If there is a code in the hospital, they're there. Anybody that has a respiratory problem gets to encounter them. Always with a smile, always with a greeting. They are the most fabulous team I have ever met. And I want to thank them personally during their bout with dealing with COVID. I saw Christy and her team sweating more than I never saw them sweat, doing codes one after another, taking care of all the patients and being there, but never once frowning, always with a smile. Christy, welcome today and thank you and your team for all you do for Oak Bend. Thank you so much. It is an honor to have somebody like you here at our hospital. And really, COVID was really a tough time for us. And I know that people like you and others within the open system, just giving us these kudos, you know, just warms our heart and makes us appreciate what we do too. So thank you for the kind words. I'll definitely share it with my team. And thank you for having me on today. This is exciting to talk about respiratory. Respiratory now that, you know, COVID hit, it really brought us out of our shell. You know, people know what respiratory does now, where before we were kind of hidden underneath nursing. So it's nice that we have a name now and people recognize who we are. So I have a question. What inspired you to follow this career path? So this takes me back to college. And I knew that I wanted to do something in healthcare, but I wasn't really sure. So you start with your basics. And in anatomy class, I really aced my heart and lung. And after the exam, the uh, instructor came to me, pulled me aside and said, Christy, this is your niche. I don't know what you have or what you plan to do in life, but you need to do something either in the heart or with the lungs. And there's this thing out there called respiratory. And I think that you would really fit into respiratory. And I'd never heard of respiratory before. So I'm like, I don't even know what this is. And he was like, look, I want you to go to the hospital and you can say, I sent you there and I want you to follow somebody around. And I'm like, okay. So I went to the local hospital, followed a respiratory therapist around. I'm like, you know what? I can do this. And so of course this college that I went to junior college didn't have this program. And um, so he really inspired me to, to go into the direction that I went into. I ended up going to Texas state that had the program and got my bachelor's degree and had an awesome time in college. And, and then what brought me here to Houston was my husband who got a job here in town. And I've been here at open since I graduated. So, you know, it just happened to be that I had an awesome professor that really looked out for his students and, you know, it put me in an, into a path that I probably would not have gone into otherwise. Well, we're sure glad he did that. Because we have benefited from his suggestion. (laughs) Um, You know, respiratory is such a big thing. And I I think we take breathing for granted. You're you're right. Until you don't. (laughs) Exactly. So what would be some of the early warning signs of lung disease and those kind of things? Right. So, you know, the first thing... When you say lung disease, there are so many different types of lung diseases out there. So one of the first diseases is asthma. 
Um, and asthma is when your airways become swollen and oftentimes are highly sensitive to the irritants pollution that's out in your environment. Um, so once those airways become irritated, either with pollen or smoke, um, your airway becomes swollen and, it, and it's hard to breathe. So you think of a tube and you think of that tube getting smaller and smaller, and then you have this difficult time breathing. And when your airway narrows, it makes this whistling sound. So that's one of the lung diseases. Another one is chronic bronchitis. And this is when your airways become irritated as well, but they produce sputum, more sputum than what you normally would. So you're coughing and you're bringing up sputum, and, but you're bringing up more sputum than you ever would. And this causes a lot of coughing. Um, and over time, this cough, cough, cough um, scars your airway. So then this limits your airflow. Then you have emphysema, which is also a lung disease. This is where um, your lungs have these air sacs. And these air sacs become damaged due to long exposures from the irritants, cigarette, cigar smoke, air pollution, chemical fumes, maybe from your work, and even um, secondhand smoke. Um, so normally these air sacs are elastic and stretchy. So you think of a balloon. So you blow up a balloon, it blows up nice and big. And then when you let go of the balloon, it deflates. Well, over time, these air sacs, because of the irritants, don't blow up like they normally would. Um, they don't blow up all the way. Maybe they blow up halfway. They become really floppy. And so then you lose your airflow. Um, because of these irritants. And so at first, you might not even recognize that you have a lung disease. You might just blow it off, that you're just short of breath just because you've maybe gained weight or, or something. But over time, you notice, man, every time I'm walking from the house to the car, I'm short of breath. And then you've got to sit in the car for a little while and kind of catch your breath. And over time, you start thinking, man, this, this isn't right. This isn't normal. And, you know, this is where you start seeing the early signs. So overall, when you say, what are some of the early signs of lung disease? Um, and looking through each of those that I just listed, your asthma, your emphysema, the number one thing is just shortness of breath and coughing more than normal. So shortness of breath and coughing more, coughing up more sputum are some of the early signs. So. Then when should I go to the doctor? Because I hear, you know, we hear so many people, oh, it's just my sinuses. Oh, it's just yep. my allergies. But it sounds like it could be early signs of something bigger. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you start to notice your shortness of breath, it's just not normal. Like, you know, it's hard to say, you know, a couple of weeks go by and you're like, man, I just continue to be short of breath. And with the shortness of breath, you might have dizziness as well. And so you're, you know, I'm using the example, you walk from the house to the car and you're sitting in your car and you're, you may get dizzy um, because you're so short winded. You have to sit in there and catch your breath. Things like that is when you really need to call a doctor. If you notice that you've had this lingering cough. And I'm going to say for like three weeks or more, this is really when you probably need to reach out to a doctor. You shouldn't have a cough for three weeks. Um, and especially if you're coughing up anything with that, you know, if you see your sputum color changing, if you see that you're coughing up blood, I mean, this is not normal. Please reach out to your doctor immediately. But just really any type of shortness of breath, when that's something that's not normal. And over time, you know, your body starts changing after 40, unfortunately. <laughs> and so this is, you know, really where you start to notice, you know, your health conditions and you kind of know what your norm is. And you'll learn over time that, you know, you kind of just throw, throw it off, you know, like, oh, it'll get better. It'll get better. But at some point, you've got to listen to your body and be like, okay, this isn't normal. Let me, let me call my primary. <laughs> oh, so with that, you know, if you start having these lung issues, you'll reach out to your primary doctor first. And then, you know, from that decision, 
talking with your doctor, they may then recommend you to a pulmonary doctor who then they specialize with lungs. And um, most of the time, that's kind of the sequence. You'll reach out to your, your uh, primary, then followed by your pulmonologist. And there's medicines and everything else that may not heal you, but right. it could help give you a better life. Correct. If we catch it early. Right. So these things include oxygen. So you'll notice that, you know, your shortness of breath, but you might not know the, the factor on the inside is that your oxygen level is low. So if your oxygen drops with activity and they put you on this supplemental O2, it may not be for a long time. So don't get you know, frustrated with yourself that you have to have this oxygen. It might just be, you know, short lived. And especially if you have a bad pulmonary infection, let's say pneumonia, that could decrease your oxygen level, you know, so it could be just oxygen. Um, they could give you an inhaler. This helps to open up the airway, like I discussed earlier with asthma, that really um, narrows your airway. And that's your smooth muscle. So once you let, take an inhaler or use a nebulizer treatment that helps relax that smooth muscle that opens up your airway. And now you have that airflow again that you normally wouldn't have without this medication. Like you said, you know, there are things it, it doesn't heal, but it does help for you to function in your daily life. Now, is there any way to keep our lungs healthy? Is there anything we can do? Yes. To kind of. Exercise. <laughs> and, and not just, and I'm not talking about going out and running and these marathons, but just staying active. I mean, not be a couch potato. You know, you've got to get up and you've got to move your body. Just walking. Um, and I tell my patients all the time, at the beginning, if it's just to your front door, to the sidewalk, that is enough just to help open up your lungs and give your lungs this nice deep breath that you need. And then over time, okay, make it to the neighbor's house and back, you know, just getting up and off the couch. And over time, just keep increasing your distance until maybe you can walk the block, walk, wait to the end of the street and back. I mean, these things keep your lungs nice and healthy. And even after, you know, a, a virus that you have, you know, it's really good to get up and out of bed and moving. Um, and so exercise, exercise your lungs by getting up and just walking around and taking these nice deep breaths. You know, COVID has changed a lot of things for us in You're moving right. around. And you were extremely busy during COVID. I was. So it evidently was a cardiopulmonary issue. Um, and it's important for people who have been house confined or even had COVID to get up and move, right? And you're right. And this is the one thing that really restricted us within the hospital is because you didn't have the outside movement that you normally would. You know, here at Oak Bend, we really try to get our patients up and out of bed. We move them out into the hallway. We have these open areas where we like to have our patients kind of mingle. And we have these areas where, you know, we would play bingo or we would have karaoke and we would get these people up and out of bed. And all of a sudden COVID came and it's like you're restricted to your room. You can't move around, move to your bed, to the chair that's in your room. And with COVID, um, it really affected your lungs and it made your lungs like concrete and you cannot move air through concrete. There, these lungs were so stiff that a movement from the bed to the bathroom did you in and you really felt this anxiousness come over you of how am I going to make it back to my bed? And it limited because now we have to put aside potty next to your bed and that really you know brings you down mentally as a patient as a 30 year old that has to use a bedside toilet you know so not only was it affecting your lungs but your mental capacity you know of what 
what you could do prior and now you can't do. And so just getting patients with that had COVID sitting up on the side of the bed, we would work with them on just doing leg raises, raising your arms, you know, just these simple exercises just help improve your lung, but also mentally, you know, like I can do this. I can, you know, do some leg lifts because even leg lifts would take you out and be like, I can only do five today. Okay. Your goal tomorrow is six, you know? And so it gave them something also to look forward to. So I say with any type of lung issues, any type of virus, bacterial infection you have, as long as you continue to stay active and, and it's small, you know, just improves your health and your mental health as well. Great advice. Now I hear a lot of people talk about I need a pulmonary. My doctor said I need a pulmonary function test. Right. What is that? And why and would know, we need it? And, and I think that we'll start seeing more of this pulmonary function test after COVID. So what this test does is looks at your lung capacity, what your lung volume is, and what damage has been done to your lungs. So like I mentioned previously, you, we talk about asthma and we talk about emphysema. So this really helps the doctor diagnose, do you have asthma? Do you have emphysema? And so this test is ordered by a physician. Now, some physicians have this capability in their office and some don't. And a lot of times you can find this procedure in hospitals. So a lot of times the doctor will write the order for you to get a PFT um, at a hospital here at Open. We provide that. And you are instructed to do these different breathing exercises. Take a deep breath in, blow it all out. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Suck it in, suck it in, suck it in, suck it in. Blow it out. Um, There are some that it's panting. And so you're just breathing in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out as fast as you can. So we have these different lung breathing exercises that we have you perform. And out of those exams really kind of tells us, do you have a restrictive problem or do you have what is an obstructive problem? So a restrictive problem is where your lungs um, cannot fully expand. And then an obstructive is exactly what it sounds like. There's something obstructing it, some damage that's caused your airway to narrow. But both of these exams are usually ordered by the physician when you go in with shortness of breath. He's like, okay, you've got shortness of breath. Let's figure out why you have shortness of breath. And this is one of the tests that the doctor should probably order. So it's kind of like the stress test of your lungs. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it is. And it's stress. Um, (laughs) Yeah. You really walk out short of breath. No, Um, we make sure that you're safe to walk, you know, walk out and make sure you catch your breath and you know, we, we work with you on these exercises because of course you're coming in because you're short of breath. So you think somebody that's short of breath can really take a full breath in and blow it all out. And so we really work with you and coach you so that we have the best results as possible. And then with COVID, you know, it's the unknown. So what did this really do to your lungs? So I think this is another test that we'll be seeing a lot sooner rather than later. So a lot of us have gone to the doctor and had them put the little thing on our finger and do a pulse ox. But then there's also a blood gas test. What are the differences and what do they tell you? So like you said, the pulse ox um, that they put on your finger is painless, right? It's just a clip that goes on your finger. It reads um, through your fingernail bed to your capillaries. This gives the oxygen percentage of your blood. So you want that number in the 90s. Now a blood gas, that's painful. That's a blood stick, you know? So that is a lab draw. This is a doctor's order that you have to go into the hospital and usually, and it it can be done outpatient, but we see a lot of this done for inpatient patients that are having difficulty breathing. And this really helps us on the hospital side, healthcare side of really what's going on and why you're short of breath. It looks at your carbon dioxide level. It looks at your pH level. 
looks at your hemoglobin, your bicarb levels, and it helps us determine why you're going downhill. And then what these numbers, we can then flip those numbers and get you back to your normal. So if your carbon dioxide level is really high, you know, we can put you on a machine that helps to lower your carbon dioxide level. If your oxygen level is low, we can put you on some oxygen to help bring up that number. Um, and where a pulse ox is, the one that's just a clip that goes on your finger, it lets you know that your oxygen level is good in the 90s. If you see it in the 80s, that might be a little concerning and you might want to reach out to your doctor. And so that's just a really quick test to, you know, know that, okay, you're good. And I think it's really helpful to have something like this at home. Um, a pulse ox, especially if you start to notice that you're a shortness of breath and you can really watch that number and you can trend it like you trend your blood pressure, you know? And so when you do go to your annual appointment or maybe you've been sick lately, you can provide these numbers to your doctor and be like, look, my oxygen level got down to 91. You know, is this concerning? Is this okay for me? And, you know, it'd be something that you would talk to your doctor about, but you definitely don't want a blood gas. It hurts. <laughs> Nobody wants to. That's what I hear. <laughs> Nobody wants that. So we've talked about kind of adults and those kind of things, but children. Children are so hard to figure yes. out sometimes because they are so resilient. How would we know if a child has the beginnings of pneumonia or asthma or something we should be concerned about? Sure. And, you know, kids are so tricky because, man, when they go down, they go down fast. And so and it, it's really hard to really tell between a common cold versus pneumonia or, you know, is it asthma? Um, and so, you know, it's really, it, it's just, it's tricky and it's, and it's fast and you've got to react fast as a parent. So you know, at the beginning, you may see signs of like a normal cold and this cold just continues to linger and your child just continues to cough more and more. And then they have a fever and they're short of breath and they're just fussy. Um, at this point, you would, you know, probably take your child to the doctor and uh, just the doctor using a stethoscope and listening to the child's lungs will really help you determine like, is there junk in the lungs? They'll sound junky. Um, and when you even put your hand on the, the child's chest, sometimes you can feel it rattling and, and that would be something like, okay, I've got to get my child to the doctor, but I hope that you would send your child to the doctor prior to that. You know, you would just know that, okay, there's something going on, but you know, for pneumonia, um, it comes on fast without warning. Um, you just have the basic shortness of breath, coughing, and for a child, it's sometimes hard for them to cough up or let them know that they've coughed up stuff because they probably swallow it. And so when you go to the doctor, they'll order an x-ray and uh, listen. And on the x-ray, that's where it'll be confirmed that you have pneumonia. And then, you know, you talk about asthma and that really comes on um, for children with that have allergies. And so it's learning what your allergies are and what's triggering your airways to swell. And so my child, you know, when she was younger, she was constantly sick and it wasn't until and had this every time she would get sick, it would go straight to her lungs. And then she would have an ear infection. And finally we went to an allergist and she, she's allergic to dogs. I have a dog. And so this is what was causing her airways to swell and have the asthma. And so now it's getting rid of my lovely dog to take care of my child, because of course you're going to do whatever you can to protect your child. And, and so it was a couple of years and we've introduced a dog back into her house now and she's fine. So, you know, children can grow out of asthma, um, but it's just learning what is, what is the trigger? What is causing that? And so then that's, you know, where you would reach out to your doctor at that point. And, you know, several tests are done. You have the allergy test. Um, but asthma is the same, you know, you have that shortness of breath and I mean, it can even be caused by stress. Stress can really um, trigger you to kind of shut down and your airway to 
to close too. But oftentimes it's due to something that is probably within your house. Allergies, dust, a dog, <laughs> my poor buddy. <laughs> Aww. So don't take chances. I mean, it, it's right. hard to see with kids. It's hard to see with adults sometimes. Yes. I think that the regular thing is we always hear if you're having chest pain, get to the emergency room. Don't hesitate. You're right. But it's the same with shortness of breath and anything. You may not have to go to the emergency room. Right. But do seek help. Yes. And don't put it in the back burner, you know, like be aware of your body and the changes and, and speak to that and make sure that you talk to your doctor about what's going on um, and make sure that they hear you and they listen to what your concerns are. And, you know, hopefully you have that relationship with your doctor that knows you and can take care of you and provide you with the information that you need and then seek that help, you know, whether you need to see a pulmonary doctor or do you need to see an allergist to help, you know, make sure that we fix you up and we get you back to normal and you might not be back to, you may have oxygen for a little while you now you may have an inhaler, uh, but these are things that, you know, we want you to live longer so that you know, you can take care of your kids and their kids and, um, and lung health is important too. You know, you don't want to be short of breath. You want to be able to walk to the car without panting. You want to be able to walk in the grocery store and get your groceries. So these are things that, um, are important. You need to be aware of your body. So Christy, I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. Go for it. <laughs> All right. So we are seeing COVID kind of slow down a little bit, maybe. Yes, I agree. And, and there's so much controversy over, do I wear a mask? Do I don't wear a mask? I'm scared to get the vaccine. You who have been at the core of this, what are your thoughts? You know, it, it's really hard to discuss this because everybody has a theory and everybody has you know what they think you know the vaccine has this microchip and now it's monitoring you everywhere you go and you know it, it doesn't matter who you talk with there's always somebody that has something negative to say um and it's not always positive and because we were in it it really hurts your core when somebody has something bad to say about COVID and what we've been through and maybe even have this PTSD of, am I going to be able to get back to normal? You know, my thoughts are to protect yourself, be able to, you know, understand your body. It's so hard. My theory is wear a mask, protect yourself. And we've seen it with, let's talk about flu. You know, we've been covered up. And so you're not seeing the flu, but now everybody's unmasking. And guess what we're seeing? We're seeing flu come in. The ER is now bombarded with patients testing positive for flu and for strep. And so because we've been masked up, you know, it's kind of been this back burner. We haven't really seen it. Now all of a sudden, boom, here's flu. And it's not even flu season. We're in the middle of summer or summer's just beginning, right. but you know, now we're seeing it. So it kind of goes to show you, you know, what, what a mask can do. My thoughts are protect yourself and get the vaccine and protect your loved ones. We've seen so many deaths that, you know, it really bothers me, you know, when you see somebody come in and it could have been prevented, you know, you've seen grandma in here, with um COVID and it just really hurts you and you sit at the bedside and you cry with them because I wish that the people around her could have protected her and come in wearing a mask maybe they don't like to but do it for grandma um and so those are the things that you know really hurts and and it hurts you personally because you may not know them but you just wish that people would protect the loved ones that are around them and hopefully with this vaccine 
and people getting vaccinated, we've definitely seen it slow down. So the vaccine is definitely working. People that mask, it definitely worked. So these are things that we've seen and it's going in the right direction. So I think we continue to vaccinate. We continue to wear the mask until more of the population is vaccinated. And then maybe we can start laxing off like we're seeing now in some places, you know, you don't need a mask to go in, but you know, you've got to do what you're comfortable with. So if you still feel like you need to wear a mask, please wear a mask. Don't feel, you know, that you can't still wear a mask. You've got to be able to listen to your own body and what you're comfortable with. And um, my whole takeaway is COVID is scary and you don't want COVID. We've seen a lot of people really sick and just protect your loved ones. And if you've been in a crowd and you know somebody in the crowd that's had it, please mask up so that you don't pass it on to somebody else. Thankful that I'm here and I've seen it, but I definitely don't ever want to go through that again. <laughs> yes. And the vaccine's scary. I have to tell you, I was a little scared right, to take yeah. the vaccine because I have some underlying issues. Right. But I did. And I have to tell you, mentally and physically, I'm glad I did because yeah. the mental piece of I've had the vaccine. Yes. But I still wear a mask. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, you know, the vaccine too was really scary. I mean, it's this unknown um, and nobody's really knows what the side effects are. Nobody knows what the long-term effects of this will be. Is it something that we have to take yearly? Is one shot going to be enough? You know, all these things are still out there and in the unknown. Um, but you've seen people that have gone through the vaccine and there's not that side effect, you know, that, that makes it scary. It's like, okay, it's done. I've got it. And it seems to be working very well. It's better than getting COVID. Yes. Yes. hundred percent. Yes. So Christy, is there anything else you want us to know? No, I think we've covered a lot and I hope that somebody out there takes away from this and, you know, you go to the doctor with the shortness of breath that you've been having or this cough that's been lingering for a while. Um, I hope that you reach out to your physician. I'm glad that I was on here today to speak about lung health and bring um, appreciation to what we do. And thank you again for having me. Christy, you and your team have been amazing again. And it's a peace knowing that if we do need you, your team's there yes. and we got the best. I want to thank Christy for joining us today. And a big thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. Beginning now, set an intention and a relentless focus on living your life as the greatest person you can be in all situations. Please join us next week. Thank you for joining us today on Oak Bend Medical Center Happy Hour Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast and invite you to email us at oakbendhappyhourpodcast at obmc.org with any questions or topics that you would like for us to cover. Remember, you can find us here each Friday at 5. Until next week, be mindful and stay healthy.